So, I remember actually being in Vermont, um, being a camp counselor, and they were afraid just because I talked about freedom and being fair and having a camper's advocate and having a suggestion box. That was one of the biggest, scariest, radical ideas. They were like, what? A suggestion box. Um, so, they had... Uh, you know, the suggestion box. Anyways, they was afraid that a coup d'etat was going to happen. So really, I thought that they were afraid of their own worst. You know, they're like, oh, my God, we are a totalitarian society. What if we are wrong? All they need to do is question us, and then we're done. So just the questioning of established systems can be enough of a reason for people to get all reactionary and terrified and squash you before you even get a chance to uh, change anything. So I want to talk about the Russian Revolution. Okay, so the Russian Revolution... There's a, there's a whole bunch of revolutions, and actually even think about the French Revolution. The French Revolution that I speak of is when they chopped off their heads, right? So that's in the 1790s. But there's going to be another French Revolution in the 1840s, or it was around there. There was also the French, the 1848 Revolution that started in France, right? So there was one in, attempted revolution in 1848, so more of a rebellion, I guess, right? If it's a failed revolution, it's a rebellion. And so then 1791 was, um, you know, the big one. And so it seems like all the countries, when you talk about the French Revolution, that's the one that they talk about, whereas where, you know, uh, King Louis and Marie Antoinette got their head chopped off. Uh, the Egyptian Revolution actually reminded me of this a little bit, not identical, but sort of humiliating the uh, head of state. You had Mubarak who was tied up in, like, in a cage, you know, looking like a monkey in a cage. And... Um, and that used to be the head of state, right? So they didn't execute him. They didn't go full on revolution like the French did. Um, and now you got the the uh, military who's elected themselves. So they was doing the dem democratic process in the background, controlling everything. Everybody was like, oh, how good, how neat. And then all of a sudden they said, ah, screw these elections. We're just going to take power. And then that's what they did. So they took power. Um, so Nicholas II, the October Revolution, I was actually wanting to think about like which one was more of a bloodless coup d'etat. They were both done by force. Um, so you had uh, England's glorious revolution, right? A Bill of Rights does appear after this glorious revolution, a bloodless revolution, except for in Ireland and Scotland. They had to be put down forcefully, of course. The Scots and Irish, they always... Uh, they can't get on board with England's dominance of the world, <laughs> especially since they're the first colony. They shouldn't, you know. They should be four independent union together. You know, <laughs> I don't know, four counties in a, 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 a confederation. That's what they should be. So, anyways, um, I, I I defend the four state solution for the United Kingdom. <laughs> So, okay, so let's see. The revolutionaries, um, the bloodless ones. I heard that Lenin and, and Stalin and Trotsky and then they just marched in, took power, and that was it. No bloodshed whatsoever. Same thing for England. Basically, the dictator just walks off, and then these other people, they was not trying to invade the country and take it over, but since the guy took off, they elected him. They was like, well, since you're here, why don't you all, you know, you want to lead the country? <laughs> like, all right, let's lead the country. And so Parliament chose these invaders who were Dutch, so the Dutch actually rescued England, you know, from their monarchy, their tyrannical monarch. Um, and then that's, that was dubbed the Glorious Revolution. It was a bloodless revolution. So how many people actually died? I don't think anybody really died in either one of them. Um, let's do the English Revolution first, and then we'll get to the Russian Revolution. So we've covered Cuban, Haitian Revolution. We've covered the American Revolution. We've covered the French Revolution. And now we're covering the Russian Revolution and the English Revolution, okay? So, the, uh, the Glorious Revolution. After consolidating... <laughs> the Glorious Revolution, also called the Revolution of 1688. So, the Glorious Revolution happens before America's Revolution and any of the other revolutions. It was the overthrow of King James II of England, James the Seventh of Scotland, and James the Second of Ireland. He had united them. I think it's also the same King James of the Bible. And the same King James that had the Jesuits, they attempted to overthrow um, them. I think so. I think so. If, if I'm wrong, then whatever. Sue me. So, by union of England, parliamentarians with the Dutch uh, stadtholder, William III of Orange, Nassau, William of Orange. So, William's successful invasion of England with the Dutch fleet and army led to the, his ascending 
of the English throne as William III of England jointly with his wife Mary II of England. So William of Orange, a Dutchman, right, a Dutch military invader, um, kicked King James II of England out and he became the king with Parliament's consent. Okay. So, all right, here's why they hated King James. His policies of religious tolerance after 1685 met with increasing opposition by members of the leading political circles who were troubled by the king's Catholicism and his close ties to France. So the Catholic Church, they're the ones that brought in the Dark Ages. They're the ones that killed lots of people for centuries. Spanish Inquisition, they said to be fearful that the Catholics might, you know, somebody being Catholic might try to get in and then try to take over for the Catholic religion. It's a spiritual thing. Right, but it also could be a political thing. So, um, the crisis facing the king came to a head in 1688 with the birth of the king's son, James Francis Edward Stewart, on June 10th, the Julian calendar. This changed the existing line of secession by displacing the heir presumptive, his daughter Mary, a Protestant, and the wife of William the Orange, a young James' the heir apparent. So, she was the heir presumptive. The establishment of a Roman Catholic dynasty in the kingdom has now seemed likely some of the most influential leaders of the Tories united with members of the opposition. Whigs set out to resolve the crisis by inviting William of Orange to England, which the stats holder which, who feared an Anglo-French alliance, Anglo -Fran alliance and had indicated as a condition for military intervention. After consolidating political and financial support, William of Orange crossed the North Sea and English Channel with a large invasion fleet. In November 1688, uh, landing at Tor Bay, after only two minor clashes between the two opposing armies in England and anti-Catholic riots in several towns, James' regime uh, collapsed largely because of the lack of resolve shown by the king. However, this was followed by the protracted Williamite War in, in Ireland and Dundee's Rising in Scotland. So the Weemite War in Ireland and the Dundies Rising in Scotland. So there was resistance and there was blood. So they call it the Bloodless Coup and the Bloodless Revolution, um, even though that is not the case. So this happens, this is 1688. Um, there was some blood. There was some blood. Uh, in England's geographically distant American colonies, the revolution led to the collapse of the Dominion of New England and the overthrow of the province of Maryland's government. Following the uh, defeat of his forces at the Battle of R Reading on December 9th, James and his wife fled England. James, however, returned to London for a two-week period that culminated in his final departure for France on December 23rd. By threatening to withdraw his troops, William, in February 1689, convinced a newly chosen convention parliament to make him and his wife joint monarchs. The revolution permanently ended any chance of Catholicism. Uh, becoming reestablished in England for British Catholics. Its effects were disastrous both socially and politically. Catholics were denied the right to vote and sit in the Westminster Parliament for over a century. They were also denied commissions in the army and the monarch was forbidden to be Catholic or to marry a Catholic. This latter prohibition remaining in force until the UK secession to the Crown Act 2013 removes it once it comes into effect. The revolution led to limited toleration for non-conformist Protestants, although it would be some time before they had full political rights. It has been argued mainly by Whig historians that James Overthrow began modern English parliamentary democracy. The Bill of Rights of 1689 has become one of the most important documents in the political history of Britain and never since has the monarch held absolute power. So it stopped absolute power and it established a Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights is like the only thing that I think you could say that the American Revolution actually helped. <laughs> the Bill of Rights is incredible. But we barely got it, right? They had to, like, attach it five years later after writing the Constitution, after they scrapped the Articles of Confederation because of the Shays' Rebellion. They had to smash any of the internal rebellions from here on out. Internationally, the revolution was related to the War of the Grand Alliance on mainland Europe. has been seen as the last successful invasion of England. It ended all attempts by England in the Anglo-Dutch Wars of the 17th century to subdue the Dutch Republic by military force. However, the resulting economic integration and military cooperation between the English and Dutch navies shifted the dominance in the world trade from the Dutch Republic to England and later to Great Britain. The expression glorious revolution was first used by John Hampton in late 1689. is an expression that is used today by the British, British Parliament. The glorious revolution is occasionally termed the bloodless revolution, albeit 
inaccurately. The English Civil War, also known as the Great Rebellion, was still within living memory for most of the uh, major English participants in the events of 1688. And for them, in comparison to that war, or even the Monmouth Rebellion of 1685, the deaths in the conflict of 1688 were mercifully few. So for a revolution, it is very, very low. Um, I have pulled up here the uh, the Bill of Rights, February 1689. Parliament and the Tories and Whigs participating created the Declaration of Rights. In December, this was amended and became the Bill of Rights, a bill that embodied terms of Parliament's offer to William of Orange and Mary to rule as joint sovereigns and a list of grievances against James II, laws uh, that were agreed to by William and Mary, laws believed to have been understood in 1660, when Charles II ascended the throne in accordance with the new laws, Parliament was to meet frequently. The Crown retained the right to veto bills and to pardon whoever he or she chose. Freedom of speech was guaranteed. The Crown was not allowed to intervene in the selection of the members of Parliament. So look at all this freedom of speech, right? We're going to see this. And the Crown retained the right to veto bills and pardon so they, could, they still had power. Parliament got to meet as frequently as they wanted to so the Assembly could meet. Uh, the crown was not allowed to interfere interfere in the selection of members of parliament, so um, they you know they could choose amongst themselves or have elections. The crown was to keep no standing army without consent of parliament. So that's military. They took the military power. People had the right to petition government. People were free from cruel and unusual punishments, and they're guaranteed freedom from excessive bail. So those are identical to um, the Bill of Rights, um, the top ten. Uh, amendments to the Constitution for um, uh, the, the for the United States uh, for citizens of America and no standing army without the consent of Parliament. So basically, it was they stopped at the absolutist government by the Crown and established a Bill of Rights, which guaranteed personal freedoms, freedom of speech, um, the right to petition government, the right to not be tortured, to be free from cruel and unusual punishments. Um, also for them to be able to choose their own members, right? In the euphoria of a bloodless revolution and unity against Catholicism, Parliament also passed the Toleration Act. People were no longer to be punished if they were not members of the Church of England, and people were not to be compelled to become members of the Church of England. The law guaranteed freedom of worship in Britain was uncommon in Europe, but dissenters were still required to pay tithes to the Church of England, and Catholics and dissenters remained barred from public office in the universities. It's not really tolerant. It was a very anti-tolerant thing. But the idea of freedom of religion, freedom of speech, some basic freedoms, and the division of government between the crown and the parliament, between the executive and the legislature, um, was established. So that's a supposedly the bloodless clue. I want to check out the We Might War in Ireland in the uh, Jacobite Rising also. So how bloodless was this so-called bloodless coup? Um, they didn't spell it out exactly, so there is an exact body count, and I want to compare it to the Bolshevik Revolution because it was a bloodless, forceful takeover of the government. So which one of these was less, right, L less bloody? Because these are the things I think about, right? This is this is what I wonder. The We Might War in Ireland was a conflict between the Jacobites, supporters of the Catholic uh, King James II, and the We Mites, supporters of the Protestant. Prince William of Orange, over who should be the King of England, Scotland, and Ireland. It also called uh, became called the Jacobite War in Ireland, or the Williamite Jacobite War. So both of them are actually the Jacobite Rising. Uh, but the cause of the war is the deposition of James II as King of the Three Kingdoms in the Glorious Revolution of 1688. James was supported by the mostly Catholic Jacobites in Ireland and hoped to use the country as a base to regain his three kingdoms, right? England, Scotland, Ireland. Um, he was given military support by France to this end. For this reason, the war became a part of a wider European conflict known as the Nine Years' War, the War of the Grand Alliance. Some Protestants of the established church in Ireland also fought on the side of King James. James was opposed in Ireland by the mostly Protestant Weemites who were concentrated in the north of the country. Weem landed a multinational force in Ireland composed of English, Scottish, and Dutch, Danish, and other troops to put down the Jacobite resistant. James left Ireland in reverse um, after reverse at the Battle of the Boyne in 1960, and the Irish Jacobites were finally defeated at the 
Battle of Argrime in 1691. William defeated Jacobitism in Ireland and subsequent Jacobite risings were confined to Scotland and England. However, the war was to have a lasting effect on Ireland, confirming British and Protestant rule of the country for over a century. The iconic Williamite victories of the Surge of Derry and the Battle of the Boyne are still celebrated by the mostly Protestant Unionist community in Northern Ireland today. So, why are there? They, I, I support the four state solution for um, UK. <laughs> be free, but be together.